Good evening, everybody. My name is Amber Furbank from Amnesty's Red Fern Action Group. Welcome everyone to tonight's forum, The Children of the Intervention. Is the justice system failing them? We're going to start off with an acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Larissa. Thanks, Amber. Hello, everybody. Um, it's my honour to um, acknowledge that we are all, wherever we are in Australia, on the land that is owned by Aboriginal people, always was, always will be. I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present here. And as I do that and acknowledge the generosity with which they share this land, I hope that you'll take a moment to acknowledge country wherever you are in your own way. Tonight, um, as we acknowledge those um, elders who uh, show such great leadership and strength, um, it's fitting to be reflecting on um, the role that our leaders are playing, four of whom we have the privilege of hearing from tonight or working tirelessly for the rights of our people. And in acknowledging that, I acknowledge the energy, time and commitment they have in doing that work and honour that. And in that spirit, I would like to conclude our acknowledgement by having us pay tribute to Mr. Nelson, a, a great leader from the Northern Territory who tirelessly spoke out for the rights of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people across the country, who has sadly passed away. And as an acknowledgement of him um, and of what all he has done uh, for improving the community that was so lucky to have had him, um, I ask that we just spend a short moment silence paying honour to him uh, in the tradition of paying true tribute to our fallen heroes. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations peoples of this land. For me here, it is the Bidjigal and Gadigal people. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. We wish to thank this evening's speakers for giving their time to speak out when so often it seems the wider public and policymakers are not listening. We welcome everyone who's listening in online. We are recording this event and do hope to have it online for those not able to attend. If you wish, you may say, send comments or questions via the chat tool, which is at the bottom of your screen there. There's a button that says chat. Uh, this forum has been organised by Amnesty's Redfern Action Group based in Sydney. We meet via Zoom at present on the last Monday of each month and you can, ten, can contact us via our email, redfern.amnesty at gmail.com. And you're welcome to join us at our next meeting, which is actually next Monday, Monday the 31st at 8 p.m. After our forum, you are welcome to stay online if you are interested to engage with Amnesty's Indigenous Rights Lead, Nolan Hunter, to learn more or become involved in Amnesty's youth justice campaign named Community is Everything. And now I'm handing back over to Professor Larissa Barrand, OA, who has been very kind and agreed to be our moderator tonight. Larissa is an acclaimed writer, filmmaker and broadcaster, and we're honoured to have her with us tonight. Thank you all and over to you, Larissa. Thanks, Amber. And I'd just like to also echo my thanks for the people who've taken time tonight to hear from our four very significant speakers on an issue that's critically important and, as Amber says, is not been getting the traction that it deserves. 
Um, and it's always good to see, from what I can on my screen, a few old friends there, Greg Marks and Nikki Coles, can see you. Um, and, and as a way of acknowledging that I know some of you have been in this since the beginning of the intervention, and that's many years now. So I thank you for your, your continued support and your open ears and your open hearts. And it's Reconciliation Week this week, and at a time when we're supposed to be reflecting on a possible positive future, we're faced with the reality of policies and laws that continue to infringe the rights of Indigenous people. After having the laws and policies of the Northern Territory Emergency Response or the Northern Territory Intervention imposed in 2007 and then reshaped but reinforced by the Stronger Futures legislation in 2012, the impact that those policies had on communities was brought into re stark relief through the Royal Commission into the Detention and Protection of Children in the Northern Territory in 2007, which found that there were a range of criminal justice policies that had increased the rate of Indigenous juveniles caught up in the system. Tough on crime policies do not assist with reducing offending, and they certainly don't assist in reducing the numbers of our First Nations people in custody, particularly on remand. Yet the Northern Territory government has just announced further changes to the Bail Act and Youth Justice Act that will make it more likely that alleged young offenders will find themselves locked up. It's clear that other solutions are needed and that they are known. The community knows what those solutions are and they embrace the concept of self-determination, making sure that First Nations people have more control over the key issues that affect them, their families and their communities. Our four speakers tonight are all experts with real experience at the coalface with these issues and will address them from their own perspectives. We're joined tonight by Yingya Mark Goyola, Nolan Hunter, David Woodruff and Eddie Cabillo. Each of our speakers is going to speak for around 15 to 20 minutes and I'll be asking them some questions as well. Um, and then hopefully there'll be some time at the end for questions from the audience. Our first speaker tonight is Yingya Mark Goyola, who is an independent member of the Legislative Assembly of the Northern Territory and his passionate advocacy uh, in the parliament against these laws, I think has echoed around the nation and has certainly resonated with First Nations people everywhere. He was first elected to the Northern Territory Parliament in 2016 as an independent member and has spoken out strongly against the Northern Territory intervention and the stronger futures for many years. His advocacy has been strong, ongoing and he has maintained um, a strong voice during a time when many others have stayed silent. During his time in Parliament, Yinia has challenged the government to create inclusive laws and policies that recognise Aboriginal law and culture. And he is working for the recognition of Yolnu governance and authority by outside institutions and a partnership and treaty with government that respects the authority of Aboriginal nations in their country. Yinya, thank you so much for your advocacy and for joining us tonight. I know you're really busy and you've got some cultural business that you have to go and attend to um, tonight. So we're very lucky uh, for the time we have with you this evening. So thank you again, and I'll hand over to you to share some thoughts with us. Thank you very much, uh, Larissa. And uh, I am very, 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 it's an uplifting when I, when I hear there's people out there supporting me. There are people out there who want to stand with me and, and as a same view in mind, what we want to do to try and fix something that is being created in, in chambers of parliament. It's a very lonely um, environment in there when I stand one man or one person, independent member stand against uh, the government and the opposition who both voted for this law. And I was the only one who voted against it. And I walked away very, very disappointed that um, it happened the way it did. So, and looking up here, I know there's the Amnesty Australia, 
and everybody out there uh, creating this meeting, which made me feel, oh, there's something that will will uh, lift me lift me up again and make me stand strong, that I'm standing on firm ground. So once again, I'd, I'd like to thank you for that, Larissa. And um, with the, um, the story that happened right in front of my eyes in, in the chamber of the Northern Territory uh, Legislative Assembly Parliament. Well, on Tuesday, the 11th of May, a few weeks ago, the Northern Territory government passed the Youth Justice Amendment Bill that will bring more Aboriginal young people into the detention system, set the presumption against bail when young people commit certain offences while already on bail. And this is something that I really, it was um, the government, um, most of you will already know that it was rushed and something that was rushed to get things done. Of course, there are victims in, in the, around the territory and in communities that we can understand that. But um, the bail laws or the uh, adjustment, the Youth Justice Amendment Bill, the way it is, it's just not right. It doesn't seem really, really healthy for our children. We could have done it the other way around. Uh, there is another way that we can do it to try and fix this problem. But it just so happened the way it did. And uh, now it's up to us to try and work on this and talk to people and how we can try and convince the government to try and make it fit. Of course, everybody in the Northern Territory, um, in way there are people living in urban towns in communities and other communities and other other people living in in bush communities and homeland town that could look at this bill quite differently it doesn't work for us over here people can say yet yeah, it might be okay for the other people of uh, in living in towns in major communities like alice springs Darwin, Palmerston, and down the road, Catherine, and where I am now. Which I, uh, I, so I did get around myself where I am, and I'm here in Millingimbi on the East Arnhem Land island of the Crocodile Island. Uh, your people, um, representative one of your own. So this is, we would like to see it happen or been listened to. Your sitting out here, we would have, it would have been good for us to be listened to by the government. And yet they rushed it in and I, I stood up in the parliament a few weeks ago on the um, uh, 11th of May, or even a couple of days earlier, and said, I, I put up a motion that I wanted to do, uh, have a, a select committee, which we could go around with, with uh, members of the government, myself as an independent member, and as a couple of, couple or two, maybe one, of the opposition and another uh, independent member who, who could go around, take a bit of time and do it properly around communities, around the Northern Territory. But it was um, voted out. They wouldn't, wouldn't be in it. They, the government wouldn't support it. And um, so I was disappointed there as well. So this is where we are now. This is where we are now and I, it happened this way, and I did not support the government. I voted against this bill. I stood by myself, stood alone, strong and powerful, and I said, no, it, it's not the way it is. It doesn't suit our people. 
my indigenous community uh, across the territory. We know this will cause more for our young people and our communities. Creates, it creates hardened criminals and tells kids that they are no good. And it's, that's the mind and, and the feeling that children get that when they grow up to be, after being in detention centers and in, in prison, they come out, who are they? So there's just nobody now. So might as well offend again or um, live uh, without a life that was worth them. A life that they were meant to be born for, to live a life in a, of being who they are. So we want to um, create something for our children. And we want to, with our elders and leaders in the communities, we know that all children are born gifted and talented. And it is our job as leaders of the community to find out and help them find out who they really are. See, in the world, we are born into this world at a certain uh, different parts of the country, different parts of the world, like up here in the northern northeast Arnhem Land, and we were born, and our our ancestors walked this land, and they created a law. There was a law that we were born to to live by that law, so that we all have an identity of who we are. And now, the government comes and brings in another set of law trying to make us live in a assimilation or in, a, in a, a mainstream that doesn't suit us. So this is where we want to say that we are a people or a sovereign people. We live on this country. We live by this land. We, this, the, the environment around here is suited so that we both relate to one another. We say we are the land, we are the waters here, we are the uh, song lines of this country that we can live by. And that makes us of, very proud of who we are. And we teach the children so that they grow up to be the future leaders, carry on. Mind you, we can start to adopt uh, the, um, the colonial or the um, a system that comes in education through Balanda law, white man's law, uh, through white man's education, there's education on country that we learn by, we have always learned. And this is where we want to all travel. And like I said, we are a sovereign people and governments need to stop making decisions for us and tell us what they think is best for our communities and our children. We know that locking up of kids up is not the best thing that we can do or we can see. And but for the last five years that I have been in the NT Parliament, I have been fighting for self-determination and local solutions coming from the, from the land, from the people on the elders of the country that we uh, raise our children through the local decision-making, through, the, through the, the grassroots of who we are. And that is how we want to uh, spend time a bit of talking about rapery or rapery camps. Rapery is a, a discipline and a discipline camp that takes um, a lesson in um, a certain time of our lives as we, as, as a child grows up, we discipline our children. We start to educate our children. When children reach the age of nine to 10, 
boys go through ceremony. The law is painted on their skin, on their skin to make them respectable people, to respect them. That, that they now have responsibilities. Girls too, at that age, have ceremony. And from this time on, have respectful relationships with uh, people, boys with girls, girls with boys, and the leaders in the communities, and have a, a really a respectful time for our senior elders that they that they can learn something out of our elders, where, and then they become of really who they are. They find out who the, what their identity are. They find out who they really are. And that will give them a lifetime song so that they can carry on, they can take on that uh, education and discipline towards the future of their children. This education system needs to be maintained and recognized, not swept away by Western education and Western jobs. We also need to need support for diversion programs like the rapity camps, like I said, discipline camp or the rehabilitation camps, the, um, the education or training to be young leaders of the future who can carry on and be the leaders of our future generations are now struggling right now. On Milingimbi, where I live, we've had uh, a rapery camp set up on one of the islands up here on the um, Crocodile Islands, place called Rapuma, which um, which was an example for of families trying to implement diversion programs on country for young people, and we we tried that program straight after when children got into petrol sniffing, break-ins, and there were words that people weren't very happy about children breaking into uh, the stakeholders' uh, houses and breaking in. So the people, the elders, um, worked out a way and said, we'll do it the way we did for a long, long time. We we'll do that the, through the practice that we will take our children onto country where they can learn discipline, where they can learn to be who they are, to hunt, gather, and have respect for country, respect for elders, serve people, rather than uh, making them disappointed or who can create problems that makes a community that is very, very unhappy the way, the way these things happen in communities. And I have called for peacekeepers along that just recently, peacekeepers, but the word peacekeepers are the senior elders after young people grow up from their uh, the learning on country to be leaders of the communities and then they become peacekeepers who can work with other elders of clan groups. When there's disputes in communities, when there's disputes between clan and clan, who steps in? There are people already trained undergoing those discipline uh, uh, camps and ceremonies that will act as a peacekeeper. And the elders who can work to manage community problems work and now they are the ones that need to work with police to advise them on how to keep the peace in community and these are the elders that has the same uh, job that they can do policing on community people have done that in our in our times before the um, a white man policing came through. So we are offering our elders 
to work with police to keep the community safety. From colonization, particularly with the intervention, our children have watched our elders being undermined when police step over elders and do not work with us. Our children see that we are disrespected and this has created confusion and disrespect among our young people. They were, they are confused. Who do we listen to? Who do we, who is there to discipline us? Can we see our leaders to work as peacekeepers, to work with police and to work with, with our senior elders so that both sides of the law is being exercised to make a better community for our young people. Another thing that came in through the intervention and the stronger features was the CDP uh, programs, the employment of CDP uh, projects and programs has also taken elders away from traditional roles of governance and, and placed them in a busy work um, such as lawn mowing in, in the hub communities, doing lawn mowings, or sometimes um, you, see, you would see the elders that would really be sitting in, in places of keeping an eye over how their tribe, how their clan is going, how are their children uh, being taught and raised towards leadership, rather that that power has been taken away from them. And now they have to go and work for the doll and serve another uh, business where they can keep busy. And that's taken power away that children have now nowhere to uh, go to, to learn from. So the governance, the CDP has taken away them, their traditional role, traditional roles of governance and place them in a busy community's life. The transition to the super shires was the another one that came through has also wiped out a village council, it used to be a village council that were created by our senior elders, a model that was, we live in communities up here in, in the remote communities and in the, in the remote areas on homelands, on our outstations that different clan groups live. And to live in one area, we need to um, have leaders from here, these camps, two each or one each, men and women, to form a, a community. This was, this was a system long before the council of shires and council of uh, village council model, Balanda style model came in through. So it will fit into the area where we can, we create the system. It's not about Shire coming in and create, you belong here in the local local authority, but where does our people uh, stand? Our people are finding it now, there's not much power in here. Where's the power that we used to have long time ago? where we can control our community, where we can look after our communities. And that is what, what's been taken away into, so that we can uh, see our elders uh, lawn mowing, doing lawn mowing sometimes, and sometimes doing paintings, uh, footpath, and without keeping an eye on the clan, without keeping an eye on the community that how do we maintain that structure of being a leader, being elders, keeping a watch over our clan groups, our um, future generations 
that we need to raise. Councils, our community decision-making groups have been lost now. It's been going away and it's being people, our elders, I find themselves as dis disempowered. The policy of growth towns has starved our homelands, resources, families have had more, had, had to do more into large communities and towns moved that are overcrowded now, bringing many clans onto foreign, foreign clan country into another man's country and creating problems who takes or who takes responsibility for crime and young people. Homelands are our safest places back there on country, on our own clan, clan groups country, where young people learn their responsibilities. We need to see in this time, in this time of stage where we are elders, and I have been calling so that we need to see those leaders, those councils, those uh, peacekeepers to stand and be occupied as peacekeepers through a paid positions in our communities so that we can maintain, look after our children to discipline and, and, and see when, when children young people are ready to be taken on to ceremony where they can undergo countries or where they can undergo uh, studies of being learning to be a leadership learning to be a young people that can serve and 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 have respect for community and people this is the the self-determination and the local decision making and pathway towards treaty. This is the way that we want to see things happen. We have been calling. I have been a representative to tell the government, this is what my people wants to do. Even though I am a, an independent member of parliament here in the chamber, I am outnumbered but I represent the people at their own country. And people are ready. We are ready after uh, being, being locked up in, in the major hub communities, people found that we have been disempowered, powers have been taken away. Now, a lot of people have asked, I have kept saying in, in the chamber, in the parliament house, in, in places where I have spoken about disempowerment, and people have said to me, but why aren't you disciplining your children? Why, why aren't you uh, disciplining your children? They're running wild. And I keep saying, because we have been disempowered. And they ask me, how are you disempowered? And I keep saying, you know that intervention? Intervention, that is where it started. You know where the stronger features, those policies, have created a space that kept us away or kept us aside from taking part in disciplining our children, looking after our children, raising up our children, instead of the government coming to work with us, work together side by side, Balanda and Yung were working together for the betterment of our children so that they have a better life and they have a better life, not locked up in Dondale, not locked up in prison, when they come out, they are nothing, they are nobody. And this is what we want to fight for. This is what I've been fighting for. And this is what I want to find a freedom of space where we can have self-determination and to know that we are a sovereign nation and we deserve to be respected. Thank you. Oh, Yingya, thank you so much. If this was not on the Zoom, I think there would be thunderous applause for your wisdom and insights in your work. And I know you have a very busy schedule and cultural business to attend to. So on behalf of everybody here, 
thank you so much again for taking the time for your tireless advocacy for your wisdom and your generosity so go well and and know that we're all behind you thank you so much Yinia. thank you i feel lifted already and, um, <laughs> and the ceremony it's a sadly it's a funeral ceremony that i gotta go and participate and which is uh, all families, clan nations here meet, and we all put participate in that. So they're my my clan are waiting there for me. So I need to go and lead the song lines and stuff. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, our next speaker is Nolan Hunter, um, who is quite up to the task of following that extraordinary talk. Um, Nolan is also um, an, an extraordinary and tireless advocate. He's a proud Bardi man from the saltwater country on the Dampier Peninsula in the West Kimberley region. And until November last year, he was the CEO of the Kimberley Land Council, which was a role that he's done for 13 years. So some really hard yards at the coalface there. And he is now Amnesty International Indigenous Rights Lead. Hi, Nolan, how are you tonight? Nolan? Uh, actually, I wonder if... Nolan, can you hear me? Ah, uh, well, what I might do is just, I think we might have a problem with Nolan's connection. So we'll just come back to him. Maybe someone can offline, Amber, uh, just see if he can come back on again. And in the meantime, I'll head to putting him in unexpectedly in the hot seat. Um, uh, and another really powerful voice. Our next speaker is David Woodruff. Uh, Jingley Modbra descendant and Principal Legal Officer of the Northern Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency or NAJA and anyone who's worked around the Territory knows how critically important that work is. But David is also the co-chair of the NT Aboriginal Justice Agreement and has led law reform on mandatory sentencing, Aboriginal customary law and youth justice. Um, so not surprisingly, apart from being highly regarded by his mob, by all of us for the work he's doing. David's also been awarded the Indigenous Legal Practitioner of the Year and the Australian Human Rights Award um, for Lawyer of the Year. So David, how are you? Uh, very well, Larissa. And how, uh, which country are you on tonight? Uh, in Alice Springs, yes. Right, so um, thank you again for all the good work you're doing and for being here with us this evening. So I'll just hand over to you now so you can share some reflections with us. Okay, thank, thank you, Larissa, and thank you everyone for attending what can only be described as an absolutely moving and fantastic discussion that we've had from Yinyala. Uh, um, what, what I, and you've heard very eloquently around the, the impacts of the uh, intervention and the establishment in relation to Aboriginal authority and elders. Um, I'd like to very much talk about how we got there uh, but also what's been some of the legal consequences and, and actually um, the way forward um, that's been discussed by um, um, uh, uh, Mr. Gaiola. Um, for over a century, Aboriginal customary law has been recognised in the Northern Territory with the commencement of the Northern Territory Supreme Court. Its judges recognised that Aboriginal people had a very special place within the justice system. Um, who were bound by their own laws and still are. Um, courts, courts accommodated customary law in accepting evidence of punishment, customary practice and law, uh, and it was taken account into, into sentencing <clears throat> because it was recognised that Aboriginal people were subject to two laws and two punishments. So over the next 90 years, there grew with a, a greater understanding by the white by legal system and um, maturity in accommodating customary practices and Aboriginal practice that weren't confined to just criminal law and violence, such as family law and civil law and, and, and recognising traditional Aboriginal marriages and customary damages and torts, or, or for things such as customary loss of cultural practices and dance and inability to participate in um, ceremonies. 
So it's a very wrong misnomer that we see and hear about when we talk about Aboriginal customary law, that it's solely about violence uh, and so-called payback. Now, it's also important um, as a criminal lawyer who practiced prior to the intervention, during the intervention and after the intervention, is going back to how we arrived at that situation. In 2006, you know, there was extensive national media coverage in relation to um, child abuse, serious violence in the Northern Territory. It led to a very important review, as we all may remember, the Little Children of Sacred Report um, by Pat Edinson and um, Rex Wild QC. At the heart of that, one of the, the key discussion points was recognising that there can't be any genuine and lasting change in dealing with dysfunction in communities, including child sexual abuse, unless Aboriginal law is utilised and incorporated as an integral part of solutions. And we can say that in so many different sort of aspects. But that important message was forgotten. It was forgotten in, uh, not in just a couple of days. The, the then Prime Minister, John Howard, uh, within a couple of days declared a national emergency in the Northern Territory that led to the Northern Territory emergency response. Um, and um, aside um, from the issues that um, has been raised about the impacts on communities, we also remember that, you know, there was the military, the army coming into communities, income management, increased policing, but there was also uh, important for tonight's discussion, uh, a legislative response. But, um, before we get to that, we, can, we must not forget um, the actual impacts back, and we've heard some of those impacts tonight about what actually occurred during that period of time. But there's instances that I can recall of grandmothers uh, taking their children running down to creeks because they thought the, um, the army and police would come to take their children, children away is what happened during the Southern generation. So the, the government passed the emergency response legislation that primarily stated about prohibiting courts having regard to customary law or practice when considering either bail or sentencing as a mitigating or aggravating factor. And uh, those interests can, can go to the present Crimes Act to see that uh, still on the statute books. But it's important to remember that it only had application to the Commonwealth and to all Northern Territory offences. No other state or territory is subject to this. And so having been a practicing criminal lawyer over in the Kimberley, um, uh, I could raise issues in relation to Aboriginal customary law, but I can't do this in my own home territory. It's also to, 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 to remember fundamentally that this legislation doesn't preclude, uh, preclude all customary practices and beliefs of other nationalities races and religions in the Northern Territory. It's just only Aboriginal people. Uh, an example of that is that in the NT, we have um, certain importation laws and possession laws in relation to Carver. Um, and in prosecutions of, of those cases, um, the, the courts have been able to consider and take into account the importance to, of Carver when persons of different cultures and practice of Pacific Islanders. Now, what the issue, one of the double, one of the issues is that what it's meant practically on the ground as a criminal lawyer, as a practitioner, and within our justice system, is that Aboriginal customary law couldn't be taken into account as a mitigating factor in listening the penalty um, for, as I've said before, people receiving a double punishment. Um, and so there's also the situation of people being in a lesser possession in, in um, not having equality before the law. But one very serious unintended consequences was that the intervention has had a direct impact on uh, Aboriginal culture, belief systems and religion. Um, for in 2011, there was a Supreme Court decision. In 2011, there was a prosecution um, that involved desecration by a construction company on a sacred site in digging a, a, a drop toilet hole and the failure to remove it to um, once custodians became aware of it. Now that company was only fined, uh, received a $500 fine. On appeal to the Supreme Court, there, there was an appeal on the basis um, of 
the court's failing to take into account the harm and damage done, as well as a victim impact statement that spoke of the ongoing hurt and shame of traditional customers. But the court couldn't take that into account. It couldn't take into account as an aggravating feature of that, of that offence, the, the impact on Aboriginal people of their customs, their religions and their beliefs. And importantly about the harm uh, the, and the ongoing hurt and shame of what had happened to their tradition uh, sacred sites. Very quietly, what then flowed in 2012 um, was an amendment of the provision to exclude now um, the Heritage Act, Conservation Act and the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. But I think that's a very important thing to realise that it raises an important issue that it does silence Aboriginal victims of offences and crimes, as, as we call in all aspects. Um, uh, and we must remember that women, uh, Aboriginal women are predominantly the victims of crime um, in that their cultural hurt, damage uh, and features of that nature can't be taken into, a court, into account by the courts. And then this would only apply to, uh, 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 to an Aboriginal person and not the wider community. We, we kept um, the, the, the intervention really brought a, a real unravelling, not of just customary law, but the practices within, within the jurisdiction. We saw the, um, the discontinuation of Aboriginal community courts or circle sentencing, um, the importance of elders sitting on um, providing advice in sentencing and leadership to magistrates in remote communities, um, but also importantly, uh, it impacted upon um, the education of our judiciary and understanding of Aboriginal law, and importantly, the direct impacts on Aboriginal people in sentencing and the absolute, and we can see over the past decade, the blowout in Aboriginal incarceration, not only in um, youth detention, but also in Aboriginal, uh, adult imprisonment. The, Absolute damage, as has been uh, discussed tonight by Yunula, um, also was spoken to and reviewed by many um, as part of the Aboriginal Justice Agreement consultations that recognised that these past policies and practice um, have undermined the capacity to lead and influence communities. Um, it's, it's, uh, it has seen in the breakdown of social structures, kinship systems, as well as the fracturing of, of Aboriginal rights, rights, roles and responsibility. I think fundamentally one of the key things is that it has undermined trust between Aboriginal people and governments. And we've seen that yet again uh, with the recent um, commencement of these, of the bail, these bail laws. Um, one great shining light that occurred just last year, and it would come as no surprise from the audience tonight, that it was led in parliament by, by uh, Yanila Gulala um, in his speech about the, the need to recognise Aboriginal customary law in the Northern Territory. His speech, um, which was around two systems of law walking together, led to um, a Northern Territory law reform um, review into Aboriginal customary law. And the, the absolutely, um, great pleasure in meeting and talking with many elders in communities basically spoke about con the continuation of the voice today of Aboriginal people around Aboriginal law. Um, of Aboriginal law is not artificial such as white law. Law, spirituality, morality, respect, discipline and education are all essentially different aspects of the same thing, all designed to bring about peace, prosperity and social harmony. Uh, from uh, the Yolngu uh, Madayin legal system. This report <coughs> has been uh, provided to the Attorney General uh, and provided um, 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 key recommendations. Those key recommendations is to petition the Commonwealth to repeal both the uh, provisions that I've spoken about, 15AB, 16A and 16AA of the Crimes Act to bring about, to amend sentencing acts in the Northern Territory. So when there's sentencing of Aboriginal offenders, courts can take into account 
the unique systemic issues and background of issues that affect Aboriginal people, but also not only uh, the greater call for experiential uh, uh, Indigenous experience reports for Aboriginal Defenders Report Courts, um, but also um, developing important unique systems and background factors uh, through local and youth justice courts that includes elders, community justice groups, community profiles and other means. Um, I think the most important legacy of the of the Northern Territory's intervention uh, was the mindlessness in its goals, the fact that it brought about a differentiation in the treatment of Aboriginal people, that that decision-making was not based on evidence, on fact or reason or consultation. And we see those same four um, issues arising again and again in the Northern Territory when it comes to issues that surround Aboriginal people, whether it's the Royal Commission into Youth Detention, whether that is the bail, the, um, the rollback of bail laws um, just a, a few weeks ago, and the, the gross impacts that is occurring right now in the incarceration of uh, Aboriginal youth in the Northern Territory and the ever increasing numbers that, that is occurring where there is no solution. The only solution to this issue and to the intervention and this mindlessness is to, as it's been said, uh, consult, listen to Aboriginal people. You know, let's uh, break this system that has continually failed Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory of children, communities and families. And let's give back that autonomy, that sovereignty that ability for Aboriginal people to have destiny over their own lives. Thank you. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, David. So powerful. And of course, um, those powerful words underpinned by your extraordinary um, activism and advocacy in this space. And no one can doubt that that you've been at the coalface of this and it's no easy place to be. So really appreciate all you've given for uh, the work that you've done and for sharing that with us this evening. I do see that Nolan has made his way back to us tonight. There you are, Nolan. Are you good? Right. So um, uh, I um, will welcome you back again um, as Amnesty. I think I am on mute. Yeah. Um, as the Amnesty International um, Indigenous Rights Lead. And Nolan, which part of the country are you on tonight? Um, so I'm on um, uh, Noongar Wajak People's Country down in Perth. All right. Well, so, thanks so I was gonna say, thanks so much for being with us and I'll hand over to you now for um, some of your reflections. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much. And, and sorry, I dropped out earlier, folks. Um, technology at its best. <laughs> um, um, so look, um, there were some points Jinia uh, spoke about earlier, about disempowerment. And David also picked up on what is the some of the consequences, for want of a better description, about what happens when things like the intervention happens. So just working backwards, I think first off, I might just explain that um, uh, Amnesty International in my role there, we are working on raising the age of criminal responsibility. This country puts Aboriginal kids mostly in prison at the age of 10 years old in this country, it's allowable and it happens. The other thing to acknowledge is that the significant disproportionate uh, rate of incarceration of uh, Indigenous people uh, and Indigenous children. The uh, changes to the new or the legislation for the Territory and the Youth Justice Bill, um, from our point of view, simply means that there will be more children heading to uh, prison. Um, despite what's being said and some of the details of 
the new, uh, you know, the presumption against bail or criminalizing bail, the the electronic bracelets, the there's a whole range of um, the discretionary ability of police around prescribed offences to determine what constitute a serious crime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's a whole range of things that's proposed in there that. Uh, really just all point to the fact that it's, it's, it's designed to send more Aboriginal kids to prison. Dondale, we saw what happened there. Um, you know, the uh, um, that place is is overcrowded. It's it's beyond its capacity that for the number of children it was supposed to hold, even right now. And we were in the territory, so uh, I was up in uh, Darwin and, and Alice Springs and uh, Catherine, etc., and we talked to a number of politicians um, and, and different stakeholders up there. Um, and uh, people were concerned. There wasn't, uh, with the introduction of this bill, there wasn't um, a proper process uh, around consultation. Um, and surprise, surprise, uh, similarly with the Northern Territory intervention, no consultation, just simply uh, pushing out uh, um, a legislation or bill that that um, um, will will basically affect people and no regard to uh, the need to consult and, and, and work out what are the issues. Um, at the very least, uh, some process that acknowledges that people are going to be affected and the decency and courtesy to, to um, speak to people. So um, when I think about the Northern Territory intervention and uh, the suspension of the Racial Discrimination Act in order to do something racially discriminate. Um, and then, so um, this uh, point that Yunia made was about disempowerment. So what happened back in the uh, early days uh, under the control of the, the Australian governments back then and uh, the control that they asserted over people. And so when the Northern Territory uh, uh, intervention happened, the end result or the net result was that the government of Australia wanted total control over people's lives. So it's no different to what happened to Aboriginal people back in you know, the 30s or 40s or whatever it was. We did not have, uh, um, so the word disempowerment uh, in its full meaning uh, um, uh, was really highlighted uh, um, back in history, but is now highlighted through this as a process that happened. And the interesting thing about, uh, apart from uh, the disregarding of the rights of Aboriginal people through this as a means without feeling the need to talk to people, feeling the need to uh, um, consult about what the, the effects were going to be and how it was going to um, affect people. The interesting thing is that um, it disregarded people's rights in the first instance. And it means that the, the point I was going to uh, mention was that if it was under the guise of protecting children, child abuse, that, in my view, because I've seen it happen in other places where in in Western Australia, predominantly the Kimberleys where the West Australian government was going to close 150 remote communities. Its first statement was about the need to not have to provide resources for essential services, power and water and everything that the rest of Australia has for granted. Two months later, it came out with a statement that said, oh, we have to go in and save those children from abuse. So the strategy was to demonize the indigenous community. And interestingly, the wider Australian statistics on child abuse is worth having a look at. It is troubling, but one thing I can guarantee you on the basis of the behavior of this country's uh, um, governments and laws, they will not ever go into inner suburban Melbourne or Sydney or Brisbane or anywhere and take over people's home because of the rate of child abuse that they talked about in the Northern Territory. So what you're seeing there is a different treatment of Aboriginal people. Then you see a discriminatory, discriminate law that's being produced 
specifically to target Aboriginal kids. So um, this country has uh, anti -dis or anti discrimination or, or supposedly laws that protect people from discrimination. But what we saw back then was that the suspension of the discrimi uh, anti uh, racial discrimination act of seventy five meant that Aboriginal people were just as vulnerable as they were back in the 50s and 40s, et cetera. And it meant that um, then anything could be done to, to, to us and to our people. And that's precisely what's happened. So at the heart of this, I think, is to understand that um, when you can do that and when you can see something so overt as the targeting of indigenous kids, where the evidence says that crime rate is going down, the rate of incarceration, et cetera. There's all these statistics and everybody knows them. And people have been talking in our discussions when we go and travel, we were in Queensland the previous month, uh, about going through the similar process with the introduction of a youth justice bill. It was significant, slightly different in that it, it, there was a consultation, there was a hearing, and people would give submissions and things. But it amounted to the same thing. And that was the specific targeting of a race of people, specifically indigenous kids. And who made up, in terms of the youth offending rates, a lower proportion of the overall offending. And so one consistent thing in our conversation that, that was said repeatedly with the politicians that we went we went to parliament in queensland up in brisbane and in the northern territory and we spoke to different uh, politicians etc um those that spoke out or did not agree with it had some really good things to say but one thing that was said consistently on a number of occasions was the politicians who spoke about being more concerned about the need to be seen to be doing something to this perception of a out of control youth problem uh, with a crime rate and the need to be seen to be doing something so they don't lose their seats they literally those were their words we have to do this otherwise we will lose our seat next election so that's troubling for me because when a politician uh, is more concerned about their seat than about the, the people they are supposed to uh, protect, and there's this discussion about, you know, cars being stolen or whatever else, break and entry and all that kind of stuff. And there's an outcry. Well, we need to be protected from all that, these, these kids and, you know, but who's going to protect those children? Where's the question about, protecting the rights and safety of the children who will end up in places like Dondale. And the other thing to note, worthy of note, is many of those children in those um, uh, places like Dondale have had problems. They have mental problems. They have social emotional problems. They have FASD. They have um, 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 brain development, mental uh, capacity issues. And so once they're thrown into the prisons, the prison can't cater because that's not what they're, what they're designed for. They can't cater for the needs of kids that have special, that need special help attention. And so the, the situation is exacerbated more and it's a, a greater blow uh, for the children um, who are gonna be suffering there. And then you combine that with other factors um, where you start to have things that prompted the inquiry into Dondale, where children were being their human rights abuse. There were criminal negligence. There were assaults. There were a whole range of things. And the Royal Commission into uh, Dondale, the astounding thing is that in spite of the Royal Commission happening, um, that and, and all the recommendations that came out of it about all the things that they needed to address to totally see it disregarded and go do exactly the opposite of what the whole point was supposed to be it means that um the laws that are being made it kind of highlights that they're made that on a whim they're made on 
um, the basis of public pressure. They're made on no logic as to, and I think David said this, the credibility of research uh, that unfacts and evidence that highlight why something is needed. That does not occur. That didn't occur here, um, you know, um, despite the fact that people are well aware inside and outside of the government, the police are aware of all this statistical information. And the other thing we found is that even, even uh, police were saying, hey, you know, this things uh, wouldn't work. They know what was coming. And then, um, from there, what happened is uh, you ended up with a, with with a uh, process that's going to um, put kids back. And Yinia spoke about once you end up in this trap, going through um, the system, there's a likelihood that you you it's a training ground. And kids are going to end up, uh, you know, the career criminals or, or criminals or, or um, are going to be pulled down that path in the wrong direction. The other thing to acknowledge is there is nothing, nothing uh, that can um, show that sending kids to jail works. I think everybody's in agreement about that. Um, and there's enough evidence around that as well. So Amnesty International uh, talks a lot about, you know, precisely what Yinia was saying as well, and that is about community-led initiatives where people, are, if they are in control, that is, if they haven't had their rights suspended, if they haven't had their ability to make, uh, you know, decisions for themselves, uh, to be empowered to be a big part of the solutions. And there are good examples around the country um, where these, uh, you know, um, diversion from a prison, away from prison, those uh, social justice reinvestment, um, you know, that that uh, is the way to go. The community-led led initiatives in, in Queensland, uh, um, Palaget, despite um, the about face, initially funded um, those uh, on-country programs for uh, Mount Isa, um, uh, where was it, Cairns and Townsville. Um, and look, there's other examples, but and work particularly, um, you know, around that as a model um, in the territory. You've got other operators in there um, across in the Kimberleys. You have things like the Euroman Project. Those things that work though don't tend to get the level of support that they should. So, so all the answers are there. All the solutions are there. The community, the indigenous people themselves. Um, all of these things around solutions are there, but I I'm, I'm, I'm stumped as to why politicians just refuse. Well, I know why. It's because they, it's about the optics, about their constituency and maintaining their seat. That's all I could bring it down to. Um, and when that occurs, that means that we have people sitting in parliament, sitting in those positions not to represent the people, but to represent themselves. Um, so look, I, 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 um, the frustration is there. Um, I, I just think that what's really at the heart of this is the, uh, you know, the overt um, racism of a system that, by default, will mean that Aboriginal people, in every manner of um, social and socioeconomic circumstance will be defined to to poor evidentiary low um, um, indicators um, because it means that there is this whole of system approach to the way Aboriginal people that's been um, far too long been the accepted norm in this country that People, Aboriginal people can be treated like this and it's okay. Aboriginal kids can be sent to jail and it's okay. As young as 10 years old and it's okay. Um, the territories, uh, the children are led to believe by some of the uh, um, uh, statistics and figures that the children uh, close to 100% represented of those being all Aboriginal in, in, in incarceration. 
um, between the ages of, uh, what was it, uh, 10 to 17. So that's shocking, and this country ought to be really, really um, alarmed about that. Um, and so if I really wanted to think, uh, make a final point about this, it would be to understand that what is it that, uh, you know, those systems, institutions, mechanisms, legislative frameworks, policies, etc., that perpetuate the status for, or, or the status quo for Aboriginal people as being, a, 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 you know, the subject of all of these types of atrocities. I think atrocities is the correct word that happens in this country. And then the other is that what is it, you know, people in Australia have a good heart. They know right from wrong. And so we, we call upon people to, you know, everybody plays a part. And that's one of the roles of amnesty is to mobilize people to stand up and to rally and to campaign and do all of those things. And there are other like-minded organizations that we are linked to. There is a coalition of indigenous and non-indigenous organizations doing their bit to raise attention to this, to protest, to um, you know, write to politicians. There are so many fronts. And when you look at it, it's quite a groundswell of activity and movement. But yet somehow, somehow, the politicians still end up doing what they do best. And that is to wrest control of people's lives away from them and take control of their lives so that they disempower them and they then are pretty much guaranteeing that the government determines the outcome for Aboriginal people by its constructs. So look, that's all I wanted to say on that. I, I, um, the Northern Territory is a whole bag of uh, symptoms. Uh, everything that we deal with in our everyday life as Aboriginal people are symptoms of this uneven uh, uh, playing field. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no consequences, uh, you know, and, and the only point I might add is if you look at black lives and uh, uh, deaths in custody, what I've been saying is that today in a, today's Australia, that it is legal to kill Aboriginal people because there are no consequences at law. Anyway, I'll leave it there before I become too yeah, emotional. And thank you. Thank you so much, Nolan. And, um, all the good work you're doing at Amnesty. And I know that after um, we finish with the speakers tonight, you're going to stay on for people to find out a bit more about the work you're doing with Amnesty and how people can get involved. And if they're getting worked up, maybe take that energy and that emotion and, and put it into action. Um, little shout out to Shalina too. I can see her there on my screen. Hi. Um, now, never were the words uh, last but not least truer than when it comes to our next speaker tonight. Um, it's Eddie Cabillo, um, who has been, you know, an absolute champion for Aboriginal rights as long as I've known him. Which is too, <laughs> too long to that to um, that it would be polite to mention now. Eddie. That's right. Um, Eddie is an Aboriginal man with strong family links to both urban and rural areas throughout the Northern Territory. His mother is uh, Larrakia Wadjigan descent and his father is from Central Aranda. Eddie is a lawyer and has been an ATSIC commissioner. He's been the CEO of Natsals, the anti-discrimination commissioner in the Northern Territory. So really has um, been always very true to his cultural heritage and traditional laws, but um, also been a strong, tireless advocate in the space for reform. In 2017, Eddie took up the opportunity to work on the Royal Commission into the protection and detention of children in the Northern Territory. Um, he's currently undertaking a PhD at the University of Technology with probably some poor long suffering supervisor out there and yeah. <laughs> owes him a chapter of feedback. Yeah. Um, but Eddie is also working part-time at the University of Melbourne's Law School as a senior fellow. So we're really lucky to have you with us tonight, Eddie. Um, and, and where are you tonight? Whose country? 
I'm on Turrbal and Yagara country at the moment. Right. Well, I'll hand over to you for, for your yep. on tonight's um, issue. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, and for those people who hung around, I know it's a bit late, so I'll, I'll try and be quick. Um, yeah, look, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country where everyone's sitting at the moment, um, particularly their um, elders past and present. Uh, look, you know, as an Indigenous person um, with experience working in the justice system, it, you know, for that for over a long period, it's really clear to me that uh, the justice sector might be the last bastion of um, colonialism in this country. Um, while there are outposts of uh, uh, work being done to support and advocate for better outcomes for Indigenous peoples, for the main part, there seems to be a, a real lack of commitment to uh, recognise and, and, and break its deep-rooted colonial values. Um, you know, like from a young Indigenous man with, um, you know, aspirations to make a difference for his people while studying law and, and, uh, and you know, David Woodroffe and Shalina Moss, we, we all um, discussed how the, the system was, um, was broke. Um, but, you know, see some 30 years later as a, as a grandfather now who, you know, he basically fears that his uh, grandchildren was, you know, will have to negotiate what, you know, my gra grandparents had to in a system basically that won't afford them justice because of their Indigenous heritage. And, you know, I, I'm, un, I'm unsure what to do, really. Um, I, I've thought it through it long and hard for a long time. Um, I'm doing a PhD, as um, my supervisor there said. Um, and, and, and the only thing I keep coming back to is that maybe we need to really have a look at the legal system itself. Um, and, and I don't say that lightly, um, but below, you know, I'll, I'll go on to talk about that, I think, and, and, and try and explain it in a way. Um, so look, basically, I, I think part of that is um, since, you know, the illegal act of claiming sovereignty on our lands, our people have not been in the thought process, you know, of the development of the laws of this country, except probably to our detriment. And we weren't considered, considered citizens um, when the constitution of this country was being constructed and implemented. So, you know, that really has a deep, you know, rooted system in this country and logic and thinking, particularly with the laws of this country. Um, and, and look, what can I say? Oh, look, there's been many inquiries, um, reports, Senate inquiries, uh, royal commissions to address this uh, inequality. But if we just look at the, at the legal system, two, two key reports that come to my mind is the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Death and Custody, which um, since April, it, it marks the um, 30th anniversary of when it was tabled. And the Australian Law Reform Commission Pathway to Justice Report, which is, which is only four years um, young this year. Um, you look, and, and, and in regards to the Pathways to Justice Report, the current federal government um, hasn't even acknowledged it. So, I mean, this really underlines, you know, where we are in this country in regards to where Indigenous people sit in this, um, in this space. Um, in recent time, the current federal um, government had, had tried to argue that it has in fact implemented most of the 339 recommendations in the Destin Custody Report. Um, in 2007, the former federal um, Indigenous Affairs Minister, Nigel Scullion, who's from the Northern Territory, um, or was from the Northern Territory, I'm not sure if he's still there, um, commissioned the Deloitte's Access Economics Report on the level to which Australian governments had implemented the recommendations. Um, this review found that the government had implemented the vast majority of the recommendations. But again, I mean, anyone who works in this space know that's not true. And, and, and fortunately, um, that claim has been disputed by experts working in relevant policy areas. Um, and, uh, and in 2019, they responded to that review, uh, the Deloitte's review, and um, that was endorsed by 300, uh, 33 academics and, and, and professional experts. Um, one of the things that they hollered, they suggested that the scope of the methodology of the review, the lot review had misrepresented government's response to the Royal Commission 
and it had potential to misinform future policy and practice response to Aboriginal deaths in custody. For example, um, the joint statement noted that a key recommendation of the Royal Commission was that arrest and imprisonment be last resort, noting that while Indigenous Australians were no more likely than non-Indigenous Australians to die in custody, they were much more likely to be in custody in the first place. And going back to the Pathways to Justice um, Law Reform Commission report, it identified the drivers of overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples in the justice system. And let's not forget this report was done in 2017. And, and the commissioners on that report explained that this is a reflection of the multi and layered nature of the entrenched disadvantage we, we face, including social, cultural, and economic forms. Some of this disadvantage is caused by systemic races, racism in the legal system. It, it should be noted that the federal government has never publicly responded, as I said before, and there were some 150 people, organizations, which included indigenous organizations, legal orgs, police magistrates that participated in, in this process. Um, but again, you know, the federal government didn't think it was warranted to um, you know, say anything or acknowledge the report. So both of these key reports uh, have been ignored and have not been in, implemented. And like I said, we celebrate the 30th anniversary and it should be noted that on, that, on the, the date of the anniversary, there was 474 deaths and since that day, there's been um, several more deaths. So, you know, I just, look, I just want to pay respect to all, all families that have lost someone in this terrible way. Um, this shouldn't happen no matter, you know, what color your skin is. Uh, I'll just cover things I wanted to pick up on what Guy Ola said about the uh, Northern Territory Royal Commission. First, we, you know, we should remember that the Chief Minister Michael Gunner said that this report will live as a stain on the Northern Territory's reputation. He also said the day the Royal Commission was called in July last year, he accepted responsibility as a community leader and youth justice is supposed to make our kids better and not break them. He also went on to say it's supposed to teach them to be a part of our society, not withdraw. Um, Mr Gunner said as Chief Minister, he accepted responsibility for making the changes necessary. So no Chief Minister needs to address this again. So, you know, um, it's, it's only been four years and, and that's, that's, that whole statement there has just been lost somewhere. Um, and, and despite, you know, what everyone says and, and all the research says and um, they, with a knee jerk reaction, they, they decide for a few votes that we'll go back tough on crime. And, um, you know, that was the whole purpose of why the Royal Commission came about. And I also wanted to pick up on Gola and cultural um, and what, what it does to our kids um, whilst working on the Royal Commission. And a lot of stories I heard, they weren't, they weren't new to me. Um, like myself and many other Indigenous people, we, we've heard these stories before from our grandparents. Um, and, 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 and probably, you know, for, for a few others with their own um, parents. But we, we heard about um, being taken and, and not seeing family for it for a long time and, um, you know, I, I heard stories again that kids were taken and um, families didn't even know where they were. Um, they came back to, to their house from work and they were gone. Um, and, and government didn't, couldn't even make sure that these kids were placed with other family members or, or even, you know, with their kinship um, connection, cultural connections that would allow them to continue learning language and, and cultural aspects of their lives. Um, you know, we've heard stories where kids at, at, at the age of 18 are pushed out um, and go home back to country and communities and, and unable to speak language um, and don't know ceremonies and, and basically they're ostracised from their own community because, you know, they, they've been away for that long and um, haven't really had access to be back on country and be with people that speak their language and, and they, they're punished again. And, um, you know, it's it's still going now, and um, David and and Charlene, who work continuously in that space for a long time, would tell you that they're still trying to seek, you know, access in court and that to get make sure that kids are placed in proper places that are suitable for them. Um, and lastly, I just want to back up um, David, what he said about customary law, and, and look, you know, not everyone's a lawyer or, or whatever, but 
one of the main things is when you start hearing things, you, you know, encourage you to go and get more advice on it. Um, customary law is not an excuse or a defense to violent crimes. Customary law can only be taken into account in mitigation of sentencing, as Dave said, and the age of the accused, their cultural background and any traditional punishment, you know, can have, all have effect on a sentence delivered by the court. So if you're not, you're not allowed that, then you're treated differently. And, and straight away, that's, that's um, inequality right there. Uh, so I was supposed to mention something about um, Stronger Futures. And look, I don't know what to say about Stronger Futures. Um, I was the anti-discrimination commissioner for about 16 months and um, it, they had a bit of an issue with some people doing a review on their consultation process. So they had to go back and um, the Senate, Senate Community Affairs um, Committee uh, was inquired into the stronger futures in the, in the NT with two other bills. And, you know, I, I reread Hansard yesterday because I, I um, appeared before the Senate committee and I looked at my responses and I, I couldn't find anything I'd say differently some nine years on, um, which, which says something. Um, and it says that, they, again, that they don't listen to Indigenous people. Um, maybe i will be a bit more forceful if I had to go around again, but, um, you know, I'll just read out some of it, what I said, and then um, you can you can hear what Gaiola was saying and Dave and, and also um, Nolan. Um, so when questioning, I, I responded here and saying, as a commissioner, I've been told by many Aboriginal Territorians impacted by the Commonwealth intervention of their disappointment at federal consultations. And particularly, there were concerns that only a few were spoken to that the durations of visits was too short and that some Aboriginal Territorians could not participate because of language, dialect or hearing impairments. I note and welcome that many of the measures proposed in the Stronger Futures Bill contemplate ongoing consultation with Aboriginal communities. I urge the federal government to consider carefully for each community who they will speak with, the locations in which they speak and how they broadcast the intentions to visit and access issues. This consultation must be inclusive, respectful and arranged and delivered in line with local community cultural expectations. A failure to do, to do this will result in a loss of trust in the integrity of the process. As a commissioner, I would happily be involved in that process. With regard to addressing discrimination, I believe that fundamental to the act, success of the Stronger Futures policy is addressing real and perceived discrimination in the Northern Territory for Aboriginal Territorians. Um, again, I said, to motivate a parent to send their child to school and for a child to want to go to school, remote Aboriginal Territorians have to believe that a good education brings with it future possibilities that will, will improve their world, where views exist, real or perceived, that equality of opportunity in relation to education or work does not exist. I fear it's hard to motivate a parent to see benefit and seeing the child to school. And I, I only use that as one example. But again, like, like both um, Guyola um, highlighted, at the same time, you know, the intervention, they were getting rid of CDP, which was a main stayer for employing Indigenous people on communities. You know, Indigenous people have been working for their unemployment benefits at the time for nearly 30, 40 years. And it also topped up government responsibility, CDP. It, um, it, it provided money for, you know, that shot the um, local government councils and that. And then the territory government, in its wisdom, without thinking, decided that it it would would um, am amalgamate the shires and base everything in ur urban towns, which, as Guyola said, that it um, it took power away from them, and um, decision making was made off community. And you know, this is what the territory government doesn't think about. They had a hand in why indigenous people ain't on community; they're in the urban centres. There's nothing on the communities for them for the children who, who are um, coming through and looking for work and doing and want to study and stuff like that. And, and that was what the Royal Commission and, and various other um, research tells them that you have to look at all the underlying issues that affect people and, and making sure that they, that their health, their education and their welfare is all looked after. Otherwise you'll have, you'll have those, those um, you know, social issues that 
confront everybody, not only Indigenous people. If you're homeless, where are you going to go? You know, you're going to go where the big shiny lights are. Um, look, um, the other thing I, I just said is um, every, Indigenous Territorians need clear, robust and accessible avenues to complain when they feel that they have been discriminated against. Communities need education and training these issues so they can understand their rights and make practical changes at the local level to address indi individual and systemic discrimination. I, I believe that without addressing this issue, other endeavours risk failure. All people, whatever their race or background, want to be respected, valued and given a fair go. Uh, Yeah, look, it, uh, I'll leave it at that. And I'll just go on to the territory government and, and then I'll, and I'll, I'll hand it back to uh, Larissa. But, um, you know, like recently I was involved with um, Dr. Thalia Anthony, who's, who was there, she may have left now, but um, we drafted a statement and we had over 500 justice advocates sign onto the statement, um, you know, about Aboriginal children's lives under threat of the increased incarceration that the bill that they were putting through. Um, the statement opposed the announcement by the NT government. Uh, and despite that, um, they still went ahead and, and, and we met with um, a member, an Indigenous member of the um, Labor Party and, you know, as someone from the Northern Territory and, and, and knows this individual, I, I was using Guyola's word, words, I was bitterly disappointed too. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's difficult to understand um, politics, but, um, you know, for us Indigenous people, it's our lives that's been played with and um, used as a, as a political football. And it's really confronting when, you know, you know, you've grown up with people and families and, and you, you see them in court or, 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 you know, you see their family unable to break the cycle. And then we have governments who, who just don't care. And, and, that's, that's, and that's shown by, you know, we had the Royal Commission, you had the Chief Minister say all what he had to say. Then he comes up, his government comes up with this. And then his government, Who's, who's, who's comes up with this and argues that alcohol is an issue and, and people in town running amok and, and kids in town running amok. But then he supports Dan Murphy's. Um, he, they rush through registration that placed the final decision with the NT Liquor Licensing Director in the department rather than the Independent Liquor Commission that they had been considering the, the initial proposal. Um, you know, so it just goes on um, and, you know, the, the irony of this whole fiasco is that the territory and federal governments have been so quick to inflict arbitrary punitive policies on, the, on our mob in the top end or in the territory, you know, via cash debit cards, policies that entrench the, you know, the world leading rates of youth incarceration and of course the hugely, you know, hugely har harmful intervention introduced in dying days of the Howard government and, can, and continued subsequently by Labor and, the, and coalition governments ever since. You know, that's really, really want to say, but I just want to leave you with an excerpt from the, the 30 year old Royal Commission to Aboriginal Dust in Custody under, under the um, self-determination section. It says governments can transform the picture of Aboriginal affairs, but not so much by doing things more by letting go of the controls, letting Aboriginal people make the decisions which governments now pretend they, they do make. Governments will be doing non-Aboriginal society a service. The resolution of the Aboriginal problem has been beyond the capacity of non-Aboriginal policymakers and bureaucrats. It is about time they left the stage to those who collectively know the problem at a national and local levels. They know the solution because they live with the problems. So I did leave that with you. And just remember many years ago and it's still relevant now. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Eddie. And um, 
I don't think we lost many listeners through the night because everyone's been so powerful and compelling. Um, it's been extraordinary to get the breadth of experience that we've had tonight. And um, just want to thank you all for that. Um, I do want to give a shout out to the long-term allies that are there. Thalia is there. I know George Newhouse and Georgina Gartland. Well, what a stalwart you are. <laughs> um, and I say that because, you know, the, the work that uh, Ninia, Nolan, David and Eddie do as a, you know, I think we paid homage to how tireless they are and how much they give of themselves to that work. This is hard work. Every day is a hard day in this space and allies is something that's that are really, really needed. So um, I want to thank you all for being here this evening and, and listening. As I said at the beginning, it's important that we've got open hearts, open minds and open ears to when we've got the opportunity to hear such amazing speakers. So I want to thank you all for being here and um, I'll hand on back to Amber. Thanks, Larissa. Uh, once again, we'd uh, like to express our deep gratitude to all our speakers and thank you, the audience, for your participation and attendance. Um, should you wish to learn how to be active with Amnesty or ask further questions, I think Nolan's going to stay online. Um, otherwise, this is the end of the forum. Um, you're welcome to send me your email via the chat if you wish. You can send it to me privately if you want to. You can just choose down there to send it just to me. Um, if you want to wish, if you want to join the Red Firm Amnesty Group or to learn from Amnesty more about the campaign, um, and also please sign Amnesty's petition to stop more children being locked up in the NT. Um, the link's in the chat, but I'll put it in there again. Um, and over to you now, Nolan. All right. Well, look, um, I, I think it's useful for uh, people to also. Um, they can access our, our website. They can see um, different things that they can sign on to. There's different actions happening at different times. Um, and we're working on an exciting process at the moment around anti-racism as a campaign, but uh, um, uh, that's still a, a work in progress. Uh, um, but um, generally, look, our, our action centres, uh, as you call them, um, we have people uh, across... Uh, Australia and different offices, um, particularly in Sydney, and yourself uh, with Amber, you can send stuff in, um, you know, and we can then uh, refer you to information as well um, about different things that are happening. Some of our campaigns, um, there's different, um, you know, we've been the key one that's been the priority for us in the Indigenous Rights Team has been raising the age of criminal responsibility. And that's been going for quite a while because of what's happened in, the, in Queensland and the Northern Territory. It's um, we've been more reactive with some of that stuff, but um, that's still our priority to think about uh, raising the age of criminal responsibility in line with the uh, United Nations benchmark under the rights of the child um, as, as being 14. So, um, but there's, again, there's other uh, campaigns that happen across the country. We have a, a whole range of things. Our area or my specific area is the Indigenous Rights Team under the community is everything. And, and uh, um, so so that's where our priority is. So if you're interested in that, um, you can make contact. You can uh, go down to our website and see different things happening. We also look to people um, who become uh, campaigners or who become, uh, we have lots of large volunteer base um, in in different places where people can also be involved when certain things are happening. So, yeah, so Amber, was there anything else that you uh, wanted to add about contacting our centres or Sorry, I've got all these different screens. Um, yeah, I'll put some information into the chat here about, um, I'll put the Amnesty website link there. I've just put some information there about how to contact the Redfern Action Group. Um, yeah, I'll just put the link in the chat now for the Amnesty website. 
And I didn't have anything else to share at this point. All right. Well, I thank you. The end. I think that's the end. And thank you to everybody. Thank you very much, Rob. Daddy's still there. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.